So uh, welcome, David Spangler, um, a figure that has helped shape fin the Finhorn Foundation's identity for sure, and also the Lorian Association. Uh, you're one of the people who got that started. So uh, really excited that you're here. And um, I'd like to hear what you have to say about your experiences with the subtle world. Thank you, Thomas. It's wonderful to be here with you. And uh, let me just say at the outset, uh, how wonderful I think the conference is going to be that you are helping to put together. Mm. What, a, what a terrific topic and it, I think it's very timely. So, mm -hmm. um, so I've been involved with the subtle worlds. I've been aware of them for as long as I can remember. Some of my earliest memories are of non-physical beings, not uh, not necessarily human beings, but I guess now nowadays we would call them nature beings or nature spirits. But I didn't have a language for them when I was a child. They, and and honestly, I didn't think a whole lot about what they were. They were just part of the environment that would come and go, the same as uh, other things were in the environment. So. Uh, there would be days when, um, you know, there'd be bugs on the tree and there'd be days when there'd be nature spirits on the tree. <laughs> so it, it just um, seemed to me that this phenomenon was a part of the natural order of things. And because of that, as I've gotten older, I've always thought of the subtle worlds as a parallel and interconnected ecosystem. Uh, and because of my training in biology, I draw on biological metaphors uh, as much as anything else in explaining my experiences or trying to uh, put words to what I perceive. And so I, it's just natural for me to think of the subtle worlds as, as an ecosystem that has its uh, environmental niches and it, it's filled with species of life of one kind or another. And that is a more natural way for me to think about these realms than, say, a mystical way or a, a religious way. Um, angels are, for me, a species. You know, it's like elephants or tigers, uh, not that they're equivalent, but, but they are a, f a life form. And, and all of the, the multitude of nature spirits are a life form. And, uh, and if I think about just what's around me in the physical world, I realize that this is fundamentally a, a a world that belongs to bacteria. <laughs> because there are, you know, trillions and trillions of these little beings on everything and within everything. And in many ways, they're not only the most successful life form, but they, they, they pretty much dominate everything else. Um, and there's, there's something equivalent to that in, in the subtle worlds. There are um, legions of these, I, I guess I would just call them points of life that interact with the physical world in many cases and in other cases do not. Uh, very, very tiny points of consciousness and life um, that I think of as the subtle world equivalent of uh, a microbiological world. And then of course there obviously are much larger beings and vaster beings. So if I think about that, it, it puts me in mind of the complexity and vastness of this terrain when we talk about the subtle worlds. And what, what has happened for us, particularly here in the West, is we, we lost a lot of our native traditions of awareness of this parallel ecosystem. So we, we've kind of compressed it all into a religious framework 
and and even that was not all that well defined or elaborated upon and and part of the challenge of this is is that the the layer of of beings i guess you'd say the layer of encounters and energies that are closest to the physical is really like pond scum it's like this very thin layer of life that is at the interface of our two dimensions and uh, you know so m so much of the stories of you know hauntings and ghosts and frightening beings and little people and and uh, uh, so many of the ma materials of legend come out of this very thin layer of interaction and don't necessarily correspond to what's beyond that layer which is um, often uh, impossible really to put into words and th there are no good physical metaphors for uh, the subtle ecosystem mm -hmm. so part of what's happened for us is as i say we've lost a lot of our native awareness and uh, and particularly that awareness that would allow us to go beyond the pond scum. And I'm not saying the pond scum is all bad because a good pond scum is filled with all kinds of important life forms. Um, but they, they are often defined by their relationship to the physical plane. And that um, can give some uh, misinterpretation, misunderstanding of the scope of subtle life. So in the, in the late 1800s, or no, sorry, the early 1800s, about 18, in the 1830s, 1840s in uh, North America, you had the beginnings of the spiritualist movement. You had the Fox sisters that began having these experiences with table tipping and rapping and channeling. And, and this spread and grew into what at one time was a fairly significant movement on both sides of the Atlantic, which was the spiritualist church and the spiritualist movement. And it, it kind of died down here in North America, but it, it still uh, was fair, is still fairly strong in Britain. And uh, the thing about the spiritualist movement is it sort of revived this idea in the public mind of contact with the subtle worlds, but it confined it within a particular uh, context, which was, uh, can I get in contact with my departed loved ones? And can I get a, a spirit guide? And can I, um, can I uh, have evidence and, and uh, psychic phenomena of one kind or another? So in a sense, it, it shoehorned the vastness of the subtle ecology into this very narrow uh, contextual framework and and some of this was there in the uh, heritage of Finhorn you know Peter Caddy came out of uh, a youth spent in uh, in relationship with Grace Cook who was one of the very famous um, British mediums the White Eagle Lodge and she was, I wouldn't exactly say she was one of his teachers, but she certainly was an influence. And, and Eileen came out of a Christian, not exactly a contact the subtle world group, but a Christian uh, movement that was oriented around getting guidance, in this case, from the Holy Spirit or from God. But the, you know, these kind of converged at Finhorn in this uh, sensibility that the relationship to the subtle world was fundamentally one of getting guidance because these realms were there to tell us what to do or to help us and give us uh, information and instruction when we needed it. Uh, but you know, if I look at the vast um, uh, human societies, you know, there aren't all that many human beings whose function is to give me guidance. You know, there are counselors, there are teachers, yes, absolutely. But, you know, my, uh, my average plumber is not about 
you know, tell me how to live my life. And my dentist is probably not going to tell me how to live my life, though he might suggest I floss more often. So there's, um, there's this, there was this narrowing of our concepts of the subtle worlds, and it narrowed in a way that tended to foster dependency on our part. It gave a, a sense of the incarnate human being as needy and, and <laughs> ignorant and the subtle individuals as wise and and capable of, of giving us what we need. In effect, there's a certain tendency to turn us into sponges. <laughs> that, that doesn't really help us, and it certainly doesn't help them either. There's no good partnership there. And I'm speaking very broadly and very simplistically here because I, I have known in my life a number of really wonderful and wise uh, people in the spiritualist movement and in, in aspects of the, I guess you'd say, not really new age, but metaphysical movements uh, uh, dealing with the subtle worlds that uh, don't fall into these kind of caricatures that I'm talking about. But uh, you know, I've had enough experience over the years to know that a lot of people do fall into those particular um, stereotypes. So uh, I honestly, uh, Thomas, never expected to become a spokesperson for the subtle worlds. Um, all the time I was at Finhorn and for uh, probably 20 years thereafter, uh, my whole thing was uh, on cultural change and, mm. and the new age and transformation and that, that area. But, of course, behind that, for me, was this ongoing relationship with the, the beings I call my subtle colleagues, or in a fit of whimsy one day, I, I called them my pit crew, and that kind of is stuck. And it's a very much a, an image out of NASCAR racing. <laughs> um, and the pit crew keeps you going. And, and in a way, um, these are beings with whom I've been partnering now for well, really since the 60s. But we don't partner in a, they're here to give me my teacher, they're here to give me guidance. We partner because we're engaged in a joint project. We're doing a job together. So in that sense, they're like office mates. They're my working partners in this uh, context of incarnational spirituality. And how did you, uh, how did you meet each other, if I can put it that way? How did I reach? Uh, Say again, you, please. How did you meet each other? How, how did, did we meet? Each other? Yeah. Okay, uh, well, um, so like I say, I've always had some contact with the subtle worlds. And when I got into college, I was um, pursuing uh, a, a, a course to become, a, to get a, a Bachelor of Science degree and I wanted to become a molecular biologist. That was my interest. And interestingly enough, all the heavy science subjects with lots of math and lots of you know, um, abstract principles and, and uh, theoretical science, theoretical physics and this and that, what it did is it, it, it sort of stimulated and opened up the, the a part of my mind that was then very easy for my subtle colleagues to connect to. <laughs> so um, it actually made me more, ironically, it made me more aware of and more sensitive to the subtle world. So there came a point in college when I knew that my life path was not going to be in science in a practicing way but instead I had to go out and, and uh, represent uh, this impulse that I felt uh, even then uh, of this emerging new culture. So, so at the time I was invited to come to Los Angeles for various reasons I won't go into here to make a long story longer. <laughs> and I was invited to come out to this group and give a series of lectures, which I did. But in the course of doing the lectures, I thought, wow, 
I, this is a whole new world for me. I really don't know what it means to be a spiritual teacher. This is not what I was training for. <laughs> and, and I need help. And, and about a week after voicing that, um, this being appeared. It literally came, walked through the wall and appeared while I was eating breakfast and, and basically said, you know, I'm the help. <laughs> um, and that was John. That was the being that I called John. And uh, he said I could call him whatever I wanted. And that was the name I picked. So John uh, identified himself as part of, well, he said that we'd been working together for a long time. So this was not a chance meeting by any means. And he identified himself as part of a larger group that he called his school. And at first I thought he meant an actual university. <laughs> And in a way, he, he did, but what he meant more was something like uh, a school of fish or a, a group that has a unified um, thought pattern. They, they uh, collaborate together. So, you know, I, you think of the, the, the Chicago School of Economics, which is not an actual physical school, but it's, it's a whole um, way of thinking about economics that grew up around the University of Chicago and so on. Anyway, so John um, let me know that there, he was part of this larger group and at times I would um, be in touch with them, but mostly it was John. And we worked together for almost 30 years and then he said, it's time for me to go. I, I have other things to do. And so do you, um, this would have been about 1990. And after he left, uh, some of these others from the school came forward and there was no, after that, there was no one single being who said, I'm your, I'm the John replacement, but rather I found myself in touch with this larger field of thought and it's these other beings. Hmm. So that's how, that's how we came together and how we continued to work. Um, hmm. So like I say, I, I, I honestly didn't expect to become a spokesperson for that, even though it was going on in my life. But uh, it grew out of the work in incarnational spirituality because we incarnate into both a physical and a non-physical world. We incarnate into both the subtle aspects and the physical aspects. And so if we're going to talk about our wholeness, we have to talk about the integration and, and intersection of these two aspects of ourselves. But then, I don't know, maybe eight or nine years ago, uh, they basically said, um, we would really like uh, for you to start being more explicit and to sort of come out of the closet, not that it was all that deep a closet. Most people knew that I was in touch with the subtle world. I never tried to hide it. I just didn't talk about it much. But they said, we'd now like you to talk about it more. <laughs> so I began then um, to do so and began writing the books that I've written so far. And, um, and, I, and so now I find myself speaking to uh, the existence of this realm and ways of connecting with it that are based on ideas of sovereignty and and uh, and the idea that we're engaging in partnership with a a li another living part of the earth. Um, so I was thinking actually in, in light of uh, what we were talking about in the other interview, uh, what this is like for me. Um, you know, uh, it is true, I'm in touch with the subtle world and subtle beings pretty much every day. Um, I do have days off when everything shuts down. <laughs> but, but for the most part, I'm at least always aware of, as I've always been, of the life in the world around me. So I was thinking um, about this, that it's kind of like walking into a room that's filled with puppies 
and with dogs of various ages. And they're all very active. And some of them are, they greet you and they want to interact with you and others ignore you. They're, maybe they're the cats. <laughs> Um, but, there, but there's life everywhere, and you walk into this room that's filled with animals, and you can't help but be aware that there's all this life, and, and you, you want to interact with it. You may not interact with it in a specific way, like I'm not running a dog kennel, but, uh, but the dogs are there, and so I pet them, I speak to them, I, you know, uh, express my admiration for them. I, I, it's just this interchange of my life with their life, but my focus is on doing whatever it is that I'm doing. It might be writing, might be, uh, you know, working with a Julie or whatever, doing housework, whatever it happens to be. It's not like I'm in continual conversation with subtle beings, but it is, I am in continual life interaction with a living world around me. And, and that's uh, pretty much how I see our expanded interaction with the subtle worlds. It, it's, it takes it out of the context that it had gotten shoehorned into through the spiritualist movement of, I need to get in touch with dead relatives, or I need to get guidance, or I need a, a teacher. Uh, and just saying, wow, I'm, I am a, a life form in the midst of many other life forms. And there's uh, an exchange of living energy going on between us. And I want to be aware of that. And I can add my love to that. I can add my uh, appreciation to that. But it's not as if, uh, you know, if the room was filled with puppies, it's not like I'm um, spending all my time petting all of them. Uh, I'm, I engage with them if and when and as they uh, interact with me. And uh, I have found that, you know, most subtle beings, a lot of them could care less about humanity, to be perfectly blunt. And uh, some of them don't even know we exist uh, um, any more than the bacteria on my skin know that I exist. I'm simply an environment for them. So it's, it's, um, it's not like we're, uh, in, in touch, it's not like there's all these beings that are holding their breath to talk to us. <laughs> but there are those, uh, both human and non-human, that do want to work with us, that want to engage with humanity in ways that will help us, humanity, and will help the earth as a whole, will help life as a whole. And, and um, honoring and um, furthering our understanding of that in ways that enable us to respond to that invitation and to that potential partnership is pretty much what I'm dedicated to at the moment. And that's why I like the, you know, the theme of the co-creative relationship that's there for the conference. It, uh, it fits exactly with what I feel the subtle worlds are trying to communicate in. And I, I do want to make clear that when I, I talk about the subtle worlds and I realize um, that's like talking about planet Earth or talking about all humanity. And obviously, as I said, there's, there's many aspects of the subtle worlds that are not interested in working with us, don't perhaps know that we are here in the first place, uh, don't care what happens to us. Um, so it's not like, yeah, you know, we need to have some perspective on all this. <laughs> but there are those that do want to work, as I said, form partnerships and be co-creative. And, and at the moment, it seems to me, in my experience, that there is a concerted push to make human beings aware of their presence and to open up new channels of partnership and connection. Hmm. And in a way that makes me very curious because you said earlier you started out more interested in social change and then sort of in the course of things became kind of a spokesman for the subtle worlds. But in a sense I see this conference as those two things really coming together. Social change and you know like yes. how, do you see those, how do you see those two things intersecting or 
enforcing each other? Well, um, they definitely intersect. And I, that's a, such a good question. Um, so I, I'm not as active as I used to be, partly because of various physical issues, uh, medical issues that came up a few years ago. Um, so if I, if I were more active, I would probably be out more engaging with the society around me. But, but my form of engagement now is, is um, both through writing and through what I call subtle activism, um, working with inner forces. However, you know, um, <laughs> boy, I, I look at what's happening in the United States and I think, um, people are sliding into such divided camps and creating such gaps between them. And yet, in fact, underneath all that, uh, there's still this human energy that's going back and forth of uh, neighborliness and of, of mutual care. And, uh, and that's something that the subtle worlds can enhance. I mean, basically, the only, the main way they have of working with us, I, I don't want to say the only way because I don't, I don't know that. And uh, I would not ever put a limitation on how uh, they could work with us. But the main way they have is to help us align uh, our own ener energies and patterns of thought and feeling uh, to um, be more collaborative and to uh, create connections. They're really wonderful in creating flow and connections. And to the extent that the social and planetary environmental issues that we're facing uh, pretty much arise out of the breaking down of connections, uh, then this, uh, this particular uh, uh, blessing or gifting or effort on their part to inspire and to give us uh, inner tools to repair and extend those connections, I think that's the main way that they are working with us. But that's not to say that they're not doing other things and, and uh, you know, whispering in the politician's ear or the, the businessman's ear or inspiring this or that. Um, I, I, um, I had a, f a friend years and years ago who said that every good idea, every good invention, everything positive that human beings had or experienced came from the subtle worlds. And he and I had a total disagreement on that because for me, everything good and positive arises out of our collaboration. They offer something, we offer something. We, we're the ones that are in embodiment and we have um, insights and skills and wisdom about what it means to be in embodiment that many subtle beings do not. And, and yet they have insights and skills in, in the energies of connectedness and the energies of flow in, in patterns of flow in ways to overcome uh, um, psychological limitations and, and to become more uh, whole in ourselves. So we have much to offer each other. And I think that's, that from my point of view is where a lot, uh, much work is being done. But that's not to say that there aren't other wonderful uh, efforts being made. So I have this friend who's been putting some money behind getting together various climate scientists with uh, psychics and sensitives who are um, tuning into the subtle worlds to see if ideas at that end can match up with ideas at our end and come up with something that is uh, would be very beneficial. So, you know, I know there are things like that going on. Uh, it, and it's experimental because um, part of the challenge is um, subtle beings, at least in my experience, don't think the way we do. They don't use language the way we do, for the most part. Um, and and the, the, the transmission of ideas, it requires some uh, skill at translation and interpretation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I, we're getting there. Good. I'm a great believer in fiery hope.
What is one thing that you would tell anybody watching this video who might be new to this that they could do to sort of make a positive difference? You know, um, the first thing I would say is uh, don't worry about the subtle worlds because our first uh, responsibility, the first area where we can make a positive difference is what we can do with the tools we have as embodied beings, as an incarnate person. You know, my thinking, my feeling, my love, my respect, my honor. There are things I can bring as a person into my environment that can be helpful to others and to myself. And I need to be aware of those things. I want to be aware of the tools I already have and to use them rather than to wait or to try to make contact with a subtle being and say, you give me the tools. But, but once I start working with the tools I have and I'm making connection in my world, uh, then I can reach into the subtle worlds because then the danger is lessened that I will be drawn out of this world into theirs in a way that makes me less effective, less incarnated, and I'll be able to take what comes from those dimensions. However, I receive that information in a multiple ways that can happen, but I will know ways to integrate it and use it in a positive way and within my uh, everyday incarnate life. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you bet. <laughs> Thanks, Thomas. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you.